Hi there Jeep owners, today in your 2022 Jeep Wrangler 4xe, we're going to be taking a look at and showing you how to install Demco's Air Force One Supplemental Braking System. So we're here in our motorhome and when we press the brakes here in our motorhome, you'll see the pedal inside the vehicle will apply as well and it's going to match the amount of pressure that I apply here on the pedal. So if we hit the brakes here, air pressure is now sent to the back to apply the brakes on the vehicle. And also on the back side of the mirror, you'll see our light illuminate. And as an additional safety feature, you have a breakaway switch located here at the front of your vehicle. So in the event of a catastrophic disconnect between your vehicle and your motorhome, the tether here that's connected to the back of the motorhome will pull the pin. When the pin is pulled, it will apply the system to activate the brakes so your vehicle can help to come to a safe stop. So we're going to go ahead and pull the pin now, and you should see the light on the back of the mirror light up when I pull the pin. And when we reinsert the pin, the pedal releases and the light goes off. And the way the system operates is it actually uses air pressure from your motor home because when you hit the brake pedal, it actually releases air to allow the springs inside the drums to overcome that air pressure to apply the brakes. When that air releases, we can utilize that to activate our braking system over here and apply the pedal. And since we're using the air from the motorhome, the harder you press the brakes on the motorhome, the more air that it has to release to allow those brakes to apply harder. So that means more air is gonna sent, be sent back here. So that means our system here is gonna be truly proportional because the amount of air is gonna vary depending on how hard you press the pedal and the amount of air that's sent here will change how hard the pedal's pressed there as well. So that way they mimic one another and you get really truly proportional braking. Some of the other braking systems out there use inertia sensors which will only activate the brakes when it sees an inertia movement. So for example, in your car, when somebody hits the brakes and you feel that movement forward, that's the inertia it's feeling, and it will use that to then apply the brake. The problem with those is that you can get false activations. You might hit some bumps, things like that, that could potentially trigger that inertia sensor, and that can prematurely wear the brakes. Other systems operate just off of lighting signals. Whenever it gets a brake signal from the lights on your motorhome, it can activate the system. The problem with those is that it activates every time it gets the signal, and certain vehicles, especially if you're using like an engine brake and your brake lights come on, it could drag the brakes all the way down the hill and you could damage the vehicle. So that's why I highly recommend Demco's braking systems. The Air Force One is my top pick for a motorhome with air brakes because it'll be truly proportional, only activate when you're activating, and you just get the best activation. Now, if you have a motorhome that has hydraulic brakes, then I would recommend Demco Stay and Play Duo, which uses both of the uh, other styles that we just talked about. It uses inertia and brake signal. So that way, if it's getting an inertia signal and it doesn't see the brake signal, you won't get that false activation because it needs to see both. And the other way around, if you have the brakes on and it doesn't see that inertia, it won't apply the brakes either, which will help extend the life of your brakes and not prematurely wear them. So these are both definitely my top picks. And the Air Force One here, if we'll, we'll take a look inside real quick at the pedal. It has a cylinder that's on the pedal. That is what activates it. So let's just quick, take a quick look in there so you can see that component. So here we are in the vehicle. Our brake pedal located down here has the activating cylinder attached to it, which is tethered to the firewall. So whenever it receives that air pressure, it'll extend the cylinder, which will then pull the pedal towards the firewall, activating the brakes. With our Air Force One, we also have a reed switch on here that gives us real-time feedback of when the cylinder is activating. Now, when you go to flat tow your vehicle, there's five main components you're gonna to need to get your vehicle safely towed behind your motorhome. You'll need your tow bar, which is the connection between your motorhome and your vehicle. You'll need your safety cables, which is a supplemental connection in addition to your tow bar. You'll also need your base plate, which is the connection point where you'll attach your tow bar on your vehicle. You'll need your diode wiring, which will take all the lighting signals from your motorhome and transfer them to the lights on your vehicle. So people behind you will know your intentions when going down the road and your supplemental braking system to apply the brake in your vehicle when you hit it in your motorhome to help you come to a safe stop. So now that we've covered some of the features of our braking system, why don't you follow along with me and we'll show you how to get it installed on your Jeep. We'll begin our installation here underneath the hood. We're gonna start by mounting all the major components first, and then we can route all the wiring and hoses to each component. I like to know where each one's gonna be so that way I know the lengths of hose and wiring I'm gonna to need to reach there. And then you can also determine by looking at how much wire you got, whether you're gonna even have enough to do so. So we'll start with the main unit here. We mount the main unit, the operating unit here, just right on top of the fuse box cover. 
And you can see here, we just attached it with the cable ties that came included. We drilled some holes in the side of the fuse box cover and then just ran it through those holes and through the holes on the unit here on the little flange. On the other side, we have the same flange. We did the same thing. And we tried to make sure that the unit was positioned towards the outside of the vehicle so that way it clears the release caps or the release clips here for the fuse box cover so you can still remove it. So we'll go ahead and show you that. If you push in on both of the release levers, the fuse box cover still can be lifted off. We can kind of just set it up over on the hood so you can still access everything. So make sure you leave your hose and wiring long enough when you go to attach it that you're able to do so. I got some silicone here we're gonna use as well because after you seal that or attach your unit to the top of the box, we wanna seal up those holes that we made. So we're just gonna use this black silicone. And I like to do it on both the inside and the outside, making sure that they are fully sealed up. All right, any excess you got, you can wipe away with a rag. We're just gonna get the drips off of there because we still want it to be pretty thick on there because we don't want moisture getting inside of our use box cover. So then we can just reinstall this. It just should sit right back down on there and snap back into place. Next, we're here at the front. We mounted up our breakaway switch as well as our air fitting. And on the vehicle side here, the one that comes in your kit is gonna be a male fitting. Now, this is not installed with the bracket that it comes with. We actually took the fitting out of the bracket because our base plate actually came with a mounting point for the Air Force One. So if you have the Roadmaster base plate, it actually comes with a place to install this. So to remove it, you'll just use a 9 16 wrench on one side and a 7 16 on the other to separate the two halves of the fitting. After you separate the two halves, slide it out of the bracket that it comes with, and then just reinstall it in the hole that's in your base plate bracket. If you don't have the Roadmaster base plate, then your bracket is gonna look like this. And the fitting was installed in the hole there. You just use self-tapping screws to run it into either your bumper, um, or you can get no drill brackets here at e-trailer. Um, you can figure out a way to mount it. But if you have that mounting option on your base plate, I highly recommend to use that. For our breakaway switch, it's kind of a similar story. Our base plate provides a mounting location for it. So we just attach it to the mounting location. It's actually just this large bolt here. Now in order to use the mounting location that comes with the Roadmaster base plate, we did have to enlarge the hole in the breakaway switch to a 3 8 size to allow the hardware to pass through. Uh, if you have a different manufacturer's base plate, many, many manufacturers do provide a mounting location for it. And in most cases, you're going to just use the hardware that comes included with the breakaway switch to mount it to the mounting point. Um, but if your base plate doesn't have one, again, you can get no drill brackets and other things like that here at eTrailer to use to mount it up. We're now inside the cab of the vehicle. We've got a couple of components in here. One of them is your monitor light, and that's located right here. We stuck it onto the back side of the mirror. And we did mount it horizontally here rather than vertical like we normally do because this is a sensor right here. It's more, most likely for maybe potentially for your rain sensors, for the wipers, or it could be for an auto dimming feature in the mirror. Regardless, we don't want to cover it up. Uh, so that's why we went with the horizontal position. From there, we routed our wire up and then just stayed along the threshold here at the top all the way to the edge where we reached the pillar there. And then we followed down the pillar. And here you can kind of see just a hair of the wire sticking out here. We just poke it behind the weather stripping go down and just poke it behind the paneling in this little groove here. Follow that groove all the way down. And then we just wrapped it around the side here. There's a groove and then our wiring comes out just hanging out right here on the floor. And we'll be making our connections there in a moment, but we do have another major component right down here on the floor that we want to get mounted up as well. So here we have our operating cylinder. The cylinder is mounted onto your brake pedal. You do want to try to mount it up high enough to where your foot can clear to properly apply the pedal. But beyond that, you want to stay as low as you can um, because the lower it is, the more leverage you're going to have for your pull and the better braking performance you're going to get. So just try to compromise between comfort and performance there. The uh, bolts you see here are actually the secondary bolts that come in your kit. The ones that are pre-installed on the cylinder, they stop pretty much right where the end of the nut is there. And it's just way too difficult to get the nuts installed on the bracket here to get it to clamp with those shorter bolts. So we did take this bracket off. There's two Allen screws here on the back side. Uh, so we used the number three Allen to remove both of those. We then removed the original bolts that were in here, the shorter ones, they're hex heads, and we removed those with an eight millimeter socket. 
And then we thread in these longer bolts and they do come in the kit. So if you need them, you can swap them out to the longer ones. And we do in this case, they tighten down with a flathead screwdriver. And then you can reinstall the plate here with the two Allen screws. Once you've got the longer screws on there, this cylinder simply just hold it up here to the pedal with the bolts straddling the shaft here for your brake pedal. Then slide the other bracket in place and secure it with the nuts. With these, you don't want to tighten it with the tool. I use just the socket in my hand with no ratchet to tighten them down. And it's a 3 8 socket that you'll use to tighten these. And it's important that you use just the socket in your hand. That way you'll get it tight enough to where it's slightly flexing the bracket, holding it securely on there. But if you over tighten this and it bends this clamp bar here, uh, it, won't, it won't hold anymore. It needs the proper spring force. And once you've gone past that point of elasticity, it's bent and it won't bend back and it just loses its property. So it's important that you do it by hand. Coming out of the back of the cylinder, we have a cable. And on the end of the cable, it has an anchor that we need to tether to the firewall. And here you can get a better shot of that cable as it's going to the anchor and attaching to the firewall. You want to make this as straight in a line as you can from the cylinder. And you will cut out some of the weather stripping that is or the insulation that's there, the little rubber insulation. We just use a razor knife to cut out about, I'd say it's maybe a two inch square of the insulation there to expose the metal where we were able to mount up the mounting point for our cylinder. And this is a good mounting point for it. It's going to ensure that you clear things on the other side of the pedal so that way you don't run yourself tapping screw into anything. Uh, then you'll just pull the cable and you can see how it's looped through there one time. Uh, so just pull it through, loop it through, and then take out a majority of the slack. We, we want to get rid of most of the slack. And then on the end of that anchor, on the opposite side that you see the uh, bolt that we secured it to the firewall, there's a set screw. You can't really see it because it's tightened down flush with the uh, side of the anchor there. And you'll tighten this down with a number four Allen key. It's important not to over tighten this. So I tighten it down until it's about flush and I maybe add an extra half a turn on it, something like that, that gets you really close um, to a proper tightness that's gonna hold it in place but not be over tight that's gonna damage the cable. All right, so we can start here under the hood. We've got all the major components mounted up. Now we need to start routing everything to its location. So the main box here, we can go ahead and start here. We'll take care of the outside stuff first and then we'll head inside. So you might see that I got a few wires running right here as well as a piece of hose. So we routed first the airline hose. We routed straight down through this location right here. And we did put a cable tie on it, but I waited to put the cable tie on it until after I used it to feed some wires. And we'll, we'll explain that here. So that, that hose goes down. After it goes down, it's gonna come straight over, basically right here behind the panel, and it's gonna come out the hole that we've got here for our electrical wiring and stuff. And it's just going to poke right into the quick connect fitting on the back of the uh, attachment right there. So it just pokes right in there. So just stick it in there. And then before we hook it up on the other side, we wanna use this airline tubing to route our wiring because our breakaway switch here, that has to connect to the wires coming off the box. And it's pretty hard to get those wires to route from this location up because they wanna just fall back down, they wanna fold up. The airline tube's pretty rigid, so we can use some electrical tape to tape our wires to, to use that to pull it back up through the hole where we fed it down. Now the wires here on the breakaway switch are gonna be a little bit short to reach the destination that we want to go with. So in your kit, you do get some extra black and extra red wire. We attach the extra red wire to the orange wire on our breakaway switch, and we just use the black wire to extend the black wire further on our breakaway switch. And we'll see that right up here on top where we pull them up. We use the airline tube here to pull those up, and there you see the black and the red. The orange is gonna be down there a little bit further. It's just not quite long enough to make the, the run up here. So I did extend it down there first, and then I taped these wires to my airline and use that to pull it up. And now we've got plenty of length to reach over here towards our box where we need to reach. So we'll start by hooking up our airline because I wanted to show you guys how to cut this. It's important that the end of our airline has a nice square clean cut. If you just use side cutters like, uh, like your wire cutters here or something, I'll show you what happens when you cut it. See how it squeezed it and now we've got sharp points there and it's not very clean looking, it's really rough. That will not seal properly inside of the quick connect fittings that's on the, that fitting that we just had there at front and on our unit and on the one inside, they're all gonna be quick connect. So you wanna use a pair of hose cutters. It uses a razor blade 
which gives it a nice clean cut. Make sure you're holding it perpendicular to the cutter so you, it's nice and square. And that cuts right on through it and it glides through and it gives us a nice round cut that will seal properly in our unit. Now we're gonna be trimming this to length. That was just to kind of show you guys what kind of cuts we're looking for. So we're gonna route this hose. It's gonna go down the side here. We'll go next to our battery. And then we're actually gonna kind of go low and have it curve back up. And that's so that way this cover can still be removed and sat on top of the engine to access the fuses. So probably something about like that. And then we'll trim off the excess. Where this is gonna to go to the air in, labeled here on top. That'll just slide on there and then push it in place there. And that's all we need to do to get that to seal. Now, let's just say, for example, you poked it in there and you decided you wanted to cut a little bit more off. So how do you get it out? Well, to take it out, this collar that wraps around the end here, we're gonna push on each side of that collar and it slips right out of there. That's how the Quick Connect works. If you're not pushing on the collar though, you can see that it does not come out of there. Next, we're gonna hook up these two wires here. One of them is gonna to have to get power directly from the battery for our breakaway switch. So we've got a fuse terminal here we're gonna use as well. Now go ahead and open it up and double check, make sure your fuse is not in there. We don't want the fuse in there until we're all the way done installing everything. That'll ensure that none of our circuits are gonna be live while we're working. Go ahead and cut your fuse harness in half comes looped like that and then just strip back each end of the harness. After we got them stripped, we'll take a ring terminal and put it on one side. And the ring terminal as you get in your kit is going to be a blue ring terminal. You're actually going to need a larger ring terminal than what is provided because the studs there are going to be larger. You might be able to fit it over this one right here, uh, but I do not recommend attaching a wire to this post because this is the clamping mechanism that holds your battery cable onto the positive post and you could potentially damage it. It could prevent it from tightening all the way and cause other issues. So you want to be attached to these posts here so you have a sturdy attachment. On the other side of our fuse harness, we're going to be placing a butt connector and we're going to use heat shrink butt connectors. So these also don't come in your kit. You get regular butt connectors, which are fine for any interior connection, but these exterior connections where they're exposed to moisture and humidity and various elements. We want to have it sealed up to prevent corrosion from occurring and you can buy these here at eTrailer. So now that we've got that, we know it's going to hook to our battery there. So I'm going to go ahead and hook this side to the battery so that way I know the length I'm going to need for my, the rest of the wires that need a power source. So we're going to go ahead and remove the nut located there with a 12 millimeter socket. After the nut is loose, hold the plate on there. We don't want that to come off. Slide your harness ring terminal right on that post and then just reinstall the nut. Okay, so on the other side of our fuse harness, we're gonna take the red wire, which is the extension that we made from the orange wire on the breakaway switch. Well, that's going to hook there. We're going to trim that to length though. We don't need it quite as much as we've got here. So this seems like pretty reasonable right there. So we got that trimmed off. Now you're also going to get a pretty big amount of brown wire in your kit and we're going to be routing this inside to power up components in there. So go ahead and hook this to here as well. So we're going to take both of these. We're going to strip each one back and both of them will go inside of our connector. We're just twisting these two together. They will poke into the butt connector and we'll just crimp them on down. All right, so that takes care of the orange extended to red wire from the breakaway switch. And we also got our brown power source for our internal components. If you want, you can go ahead and route that across. We just poked it in there across. We will be securing it with cable ties later. Um, but our entry point to get inside is going to be over on the other side. We've still got another wire on this side though that we're going to finish wiring up. This is the other wire from the breakaway switch. It's the black one, so it still looks black since we extended it with black wire. This is going to connect to either of the black wires here on the unit. And it doesn't matter which one, there is no polarity for our box here. So one of these circuits will connect to a ground source and the other one is going to connect to that breakaway switch. And the, what's going to happen there, if this is connected to ground, 
and this is connected to the breakaway switch. If the breakaway switch pin is pulled, that completes the circuit. It closes the gap that's there in the switch. That'll let the positive circuit we hooked up go down the circuit to the breakaway switch. It'll go through the switch since the pin is out of the way, and then it'll go back up our black wire to our unit here, and since it's grounded on the other side, that's gonna activate the unit and it cause it to apply the brakes if we do have a catastrophic disconnect. So that's how that section works. We're just gonna strip this back, trim it to length, and use another butt connector to attach it here. I'm gonna be using blue heat shrink on these because we, we don't need multiple wires. The blues are a little bit smaller, so it'll seal up a little bit better um, with just these smaller single wires. We then took the other black wire, and we're gonna hook that to the ground stud located here but the wire's a little bit short. It does actually reach to it, but uh, if you just hook the wire directly to it where we mounted the box, it's gonna probably make it very difficult to actually lift this cover up and access the fuses. So we had some extra black wire after trimming the one we just connected. We're gonna use that to uh, make our connection so that way we still have plenty of length of wire to be able to lift that fuse box cover off. So go ahead and put one of the small ring terminal that comes in your kit on to the end of the wire after you strip it. and then we're gonna attach it to the brown stud located right there. After we removed the nut, our ring terminal will simply slide into place and then we just reinstall the nut back on top of it. We can now go back and heat shrink all the butt connectors that we had made. We'll use our heat gun here and just seal them up. If you need a heat gun, you can get one here at E-Trailer. We're using a small one here from Performance Tools. It's not as powerful as the bigger ones, but for um, little jobs like this, it does fit into locations a little bit easier. And all of our wiring is just gonna route to the grommet located down there. The way I remove the grommet, I find it easier to remove it from the inside. If you're on the inside, right here on the outside, and just look up, you can see that grommet there as well. And I push it out, because that's the direction it needs to be removed from as it goes this direction. So I just push it with my thumb, it pops out. You usually find it laying on the ground there. After you find it on the ground, we drill a hole in the center of it. I use a 9 16th bit to make sure it was a big enough hole for everything that we need to pass through. And then we poke our airline hose as well as our brown wire through the grommet, and then we just reinstall the grommet and pull the rest of those through onto the inside where we can make our connections to the components mounted down by the cylinder. So we're now back inside. We've got our hose and our brown wire routed in. So now we need to make these connections down here at the pedal. On the cylinder, you're gonna have your reed switch here. And the reed switch, whenever the cylinder's activated, it's going to give us a real-time feedback of its position here uh, through the reed switch. So now we'll just take the wiring off the reed switch here. And you can see you've got two wires on it. You've got one that's blue and one that, they say it's violet in the instructions. I'll be honest, to me, it looks more like a brown or a tan color. Um, that's the wire we need to hook to power though. So let's go ahead and just take care of that. So now we're gonna take the brown wire that we routed in. It's our power wire. Go ahead and put a butt connector on that. And then we're gonna attach this to the reed switch on that violet or uh, kind of tannish colored wire there. Just let it slide in there. Crimp that down. All right, so the output for our reed switch is the blue wire. That's what's gonna activate the monitor light. Um, but you may also wanna consider an additional accessory. Our customer wanted to purchase the coach link as well, which is gonna operate similarly to the monitor light that we mounted on the back of the mirror, but this is gonna be a wireless unit so that way he'll actually have a monitor light inside of his motor home that receives a signal wirelessly through a transmitter. So we're gonna wire the transmitter in to the same circuits as that monitor light. If you wanted a coach link, you can get that from Demco here at eTrailer. This is what the little box looks like. Um, there is another portion of this that goes in the motor home uh, for the receiver end, but this is our transmitter. So we're gonna grab our monitor light wire. Over here, you have a black and a red. Red is gonna be our positive wire because it's an LED, so polarity does matter. So that ha the red one has to hook to the output of the reed switch, right there. And we also have the red wire that you see here from our coach link that also needs to connect there. So we're gonna go ahead and take our monitor light and our coach link, and we'll twist these two together 
slide our butt connector on there, connect them together. And on the other side here, we're going to be placing the output from the reed switch. Blue wire. All right. So now all we have left is our ground circuits. That's going to be the black from our monitor light and the white if you are installing a coach link. Uh, we're going to get rid of some of the excess here on this. It's stripped. They come pre-stripped here on your coach link wires and if you got too much there, potential that some could stick out. This is the ground side, so it's really not nearly as important on the ground side that if it sticks out, because if ground grounds, it doesn't really affect much. So we're going to go ahead and take both of these and twist them together so that way we can utilize a single wire for ground for both the monitor light and the coach link. And then we'll just use a little bit of extra black or red, whatever you have left of uh, some of the wire in your kit to just extend this out to a single one. And we're actually going to install it onto one of the bolts that's located across this uh, cross brace here. There's several little bolts there, so we're just going to pick one that is going to be the easiest for us to attach it to there. So yeah, you can see that there are a couple of bolts up here. Any one of these should be fine. I'm going to use this one just because it's not a painted surface. It's, you can see it's shiny. These ones over here are painted surfaces, so they may have maybe not as good a ground. They're probably still acceptable, but if you've seen a cleaner surface, that's going to be the better option. I did route the wire up and over the bar, so that way I can use cable ties to secure it to existing wiring that's located over here for all this mess that we got just kind of hanging down below. And we're going to remove this bolt here with an 8 millimeter socket. And you do want to be a little careful working down here. Uh, these crossbars and stuff, you can see it's like a potted material and some of the machine material and stuff down here, they don't usually do too much deburring from the factory. So there can actually be some pretty sharp surfaces behind the dash. So just pay attention to what you're doing. All right, and then that's just going to slide through our ring terminal and we'll reinstall it. All right, we got all of our wires hooked up down here now. We'll be using some cable ties to secure these. Uh, but we still had the airline hose that we had routed through here. That just simply routes over towards the cylinder here. You'll want to trim it to length using the special cutters. Uh, and then just poke it into the quick connect fitting here. Make sure to leave yourself enough excess for pedal movement. Make sure it can move around and the cable's not going to get caught on anything. All right, we're getting pretty close, guys, to getting this wrapped up. Uh, you got your inside connections done. We got our outside connections done. Next, we would normally hook into the vacuum uh, brake booster on our Jeep, but with the uh, four by E's here, that's a fully electric assist, so there is no vacuum booster. So we don't actually want to utilize this, but we don't want to leave it just open like this. We actually want to cap it off. In your kit, you should get a little cap. And then you get a bunch of vacuum line for hooking into the booster. Since we're not hooking into the booster, we don't really need most of this line. We just need a little tiny piece. I'm gonna do maybe Maybe about three inches. And then we're gonna use a little silicone spray. It just makes it slide on easier. Slide your vacuum line onto the port labeled vacuum. And then we'll use a little bit more spray on the cap. And then slide the cap into the end of the vacuum line. All right, so we're at that point now where we want to test it out. So I'm grabbing our fuse there. I tucked it down a little bit further than I should have. So grab that out of there. And then we can go ahead and insert the fuse that comes in our kit. I'll make sure I put that on top so it's easily accessible. Insert our fuse, and then we can test out the system. Now it may or may not activate on our first test here, because this system really requires air from the motorhome, and it gets charged from the brakes on your motorhome. Uh, but from the factory, they do their testing there, and sometimes there's still some pressure in here from the testing done at the factory that you can test out the system before hooking it to the motorhome. If it doesn't work, but you hear a clicking in here, 
you know that the system's probably working, it just doesn't have sufficient air to actually see anything moving. You'll need to hook up to the motorhome first to actually check full operation then. So to test it, we're just gonna pull our breakaway switch pin here and we're gonna make sure that that monitor light lights up on the back side of our mirror. And now we'll pull our pin and nothing happens. So when we pulled the pin, we didn't see any activation on the pedal or anything. The light didn't kick on, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work. So take your pin and I've got it pulled and I'm just kind of pushing it in and out just a little bit. And you can hear the unit activating there. So it's working there, it just doesn't have any air pressure. To fully test it, we're gonna to need to hook up to our motor home to charge it with air. So now at this point, we uh, just need to go around and take all the wiring we've got and any hoses, run through it with cable ties and just make sure everything's nice and clean and out of the way. So now that we've completed our vehicle side of our braking system install, we now need to come over to our motor home. We've got a few components we need to install on this side. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna mount up the tank and then we need to route a couple of hoses up to where we're gonna tap into the metered and supply air. So our tank we're gonna mount on the other side, just about right under this area here. So here we have our tank, we've mounted it. We're kind of on the passenger side, just behind the rear tire. There's a compartment located right here. Um, and there was a little opening between the compartment and a support beam there. So we just slid our tank up in there and then use self-tapping screws to attach it to the frame. Uh, you do have several holes in your bracket. You have slotted holes as well as solid holes. So you get plenty of options on where you could mount the tank. Now, I typically recommend mounting the tank near the rear axle because that's where we're going to find our metered and our supply airlines that we're going to tap into to connect to here. There are three connections on our tank. We can see two of them on this side. The one located here, this is output. This is actually going to go to the back of the vehicle to the connector that we're going to plug our uh, cable into that's going to connect our motorhome to our vehicle. This one here, just before the output, is going to be the metered air connection. So we're gonna route a line from here up towards the axle and we'll tap into the metered air. On the other side of our tank, there is one more fitting and that's gonna be the supply air fitting. And we're gonna route an air line from there up to the supply air, which is also gonna be near the axle, very close to where we're gonna find our metered air. So I went ahead and I routed hose up and over the axle. They're just kind of hanging down right there. We'll slide in here now in front of the axle. This is usually the easiest access for us to get to where we're gonna tie into the metered and uh, supply air. So we're now underneath the vehicle here. We're just in front of the rear axle. That's where you're gonna find most of your hoses that go to your brake assemblies and stuff to release those. The first one line that we need to identify is our supply line. And that's typically gonna be a larger line, usually green in color. Um, so this uh, 5 8 size line usually around that size is going to supply air to everything. So to test this, we want to remove all the air from the system first to make it safe to check. Because if you were to just disconnect this line now, you potentially have 100 pounds of pressure or, or more on there and it could be dangerous. So just pump the brakes in your vehicle without it running. That'll discharge all the air. Then we can come down here and you can unplug that hose. And once you unplug it, go ahead and have an assistant start the vehicle. If air starts to come from that hose, um, then you know from one, either side of where you disconnected the hose, then you know that that's the supplier because it's trying to refeed and fill that supply. So once you have I've identified the hose, go ahead and cut it and place the T in line. And then this will take the airline hose that we routed from our tank and plug it into there. Next is our metered air. Now the metered air is going to be a smaller diameter hose. And you're typically going to find this near the relay blocks. You'll have a hose that'll go from one relay block to another relay block. And once you're, when you're looking for this hose, it's usually about 3 eighths in diameter, often black in color, sometimes also still green. Um, this one you'll want to disconnect from one of those relay blocks. Again, you'll want to discharge the air because you don't know if that's going to be charged with air or not. So go ahead and have an assistant pump it down, disconnect the line you're suspecting to be the metered air, and then have an assistant again start the vehicle. When they start the vehicle this time, you should feel no air coming from either side of where you disconnected the line. After the vehicle's charged up a little bit of air, maybe 60, 70 pounds, something like that, you can have your assistant then press the brake. If air comes out of one side of that line, when the brake is depressed, that is your metered air. Air only comes out when the brake's being depressed. As soon as they let off the brake, if air stops coming out, you know you've got the correct line. Go ahead and slice that line and put in the smaller T-fitting and then route your air line and connect it to your tank there. 
And on our motorhome side here, we got one more thing we need to mount up, and that is the fitting here at the back. You do get a bracket that the fitting is pre-attached to, so you often can just uh, run it right into the bumper, or what we've done here is this is a no-drill bracket you can purchase at e-trailer. It clamps a bracket around your hitch and gives you a mounting location on that bracket. That way you don't have to modify the vehicle, you just clamped it around. This is the female side of the Quick Connect fitting, and this routes to that output from the tank. So just route it from this location up to where your tank is. All right, so now all we need to do is just grab the coach link. This is the other half of the, uh, this is the receiver. We installed the transmitter in the vehicle. This simply just plugs in here into our motor home. You'll need an auxiliary outlet to be able to plug it in. And as long as you've got one of those, you're good to go. If not, we do sell auxiliary outlets here at eTrailer. And if we press our brake, we should get real-time feedback since we're all hooked up to the vehicle. And there it goes, we've got our activation. I'm gonna to continue to hold the brake just to verify the buzzer works, and it does. We've got, we get our buzzer if you have an extended press of the brake pedal. And when we release the brake pedal, we see that it goes off and so does our buzzer. And that completes our installation of Demco's Air Force One Supplemental Braking System on our 2022 Jeep Wrangler 4xe.